Good evening, class. Last time we started section 9.2, polar equations and graphs. So let's cover synopsis of what we have done so far. So in this section, we are looking at uh, polar equations, conversion from one format to the next. By that, I mean polar to rectangular and rectangular to polar. So some trigonometric identities, I can't emphasize the importance of knowing them. So uh, polar coordinates was discussed and the idea is really simple. You have a polar grid versus the uh, rectangular one. Uh, in the rectangular coordinate system, we have the x-axis and the y-axis, and every point can be represented by x and y, two pairs. X is distance from the y-axis, and y is the distance from the x-axis. Uh, in polar format, polar coordinates, you have a polar axis, which is the same as, if you will, the x-axis, in essence. Instead of origin, we call it the pole. By the way, a pole has infinitely many different representation when R is zero. That is representing the pole with any theta, okay? Uh, so X comma Y in rectangular coordinate system, R comma theta in polar coordinate system. And that is not unique. The relationship between the two is such that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And x is equal to r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. Those are very straightforward. The thing you want to be careful is when you want to come up with theta. Tan theta is y over x, but you got to pay attention to the uh, quadrant to make a decision. Therefore, graphing and plotting the point is important. So we are looking at rectangular versus polar grids. Okay, <laughs> Polar grids, in essence, you're looking at a different uh, circles and basically you start with the hey. and then you... It's your phone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, class. So, <clears throat> the case of a polar grid, you're looking at distance from the uh, pole. You can even say the origin, that's fine. And so you come up with theta first and then you count each tick mark represents one unit from the pole. Uh, so identifying the graph, one of the tricks we discussed, if we have uh, R, okay, depending upon what we are dealing with, we may multiply it up by R, we may square it. If R is given as a number, for example, R equals 3 in this example, you, you square that, and that gives you a circle. Tangent. If theta is given, if theta is a fixed value, then you take a tangent and it becomes a line that goes through the uh, pole, if you will, okay, the origin. If it's R sine theta equals a constant, okay, remember R sine theta represents the Y, and therefore, it is a horizontal line. Y equals, for example, two in this case. If you have R cosine theta equals a constant, remember R cosine is the same as X, so it represents a vertical line. When R is given on the one side and we have sine or cosine on the other side, the trick is to multiply by R 
and it will become a circle. If we put it in standard form, we can figure out the type of circle, the center, and the radius. Whether R is equal to something involving sine or cosine makes no difference. In both cases, we end up with a circle class. Okay. Uh, now, of course, if it, let's, let's just go back. So if, it, if it involves sine, it is along the y axis as far as the center goes. If it involves cosine, it's along the x axis as far as the center is concerned. You don't have to really memorize any of them. You can work them out and see them for yourself. So in short, what we have covered, if R equals a constant, we have a circle. If uh, theta equals a constant, we have a line that goes through the origin. If R sine theta and R cosine theta are given as a constant, we have horizontal and vertical lines, okay? Um, if R is equal to something times cosine or something times sine, they, re they result in a circle, okay? Those are the main ones you will come across in general, but uh, we discussed the symmetry and how it works, okay? Uh, it's symmetric with respect to the uh, x-axis or the polar axis the y-axis or theta equals pi over two, or the origin or the pole, and we are familiar with all of those with when it comes to rectangular coordinate system. And when it comes to polar coordinate system, that was discussed, okay? So, uh, and it, you really don't have to memorize. One easy way is to graph, for example, we want Symmetry with respect to the polar axis. Take a look at the graph, polar axis or the x-axis and the graph. Symmetry happens if theta and negative theta can be intertwined, meaning if I change the theta to negative theta and nothing happens, I get the same equation, that means symmetry. Um, with respect to the y-axis, meaning theta equals pi over two, okay, if you uh, change the theta to pi minus theta, and you get to the same equation. Uh, with respect to the pole, you have a couple of choices. Either r changes to negative r, or theta changes to theta plus pi, not both. And by the way, you really have to check both of them. One of them may fail, one of them may not, and shows that it works. Um, so we looked at the graph of r equals one minus, one minus sine theta. We uh, looked at the symmetry and honestly, uh, you don't need the symmetry to graph it. I mentioned it. The way I will graph it is very simple. I just pick up a few points and I graph them. That's all there is to it. What points? Go with easy and common arcs. Okay. Now this is uh, shaped like a heart. That's why it's called a cardioid. When R involves one plus minus sine theta or one plus minus cosine theta, it ends up being um, a cardioid. When I say one, I mean uh, anything can be multiplied. For example, you can say five times one plus minus sine theta, one plus minus cosine theta. The point being the coefficient of sine and cosine if you take the absolute value, must be equal to the constant. Okay, that's the idea behind that. And again, notice this involves sine. Okay, something that then it becomes a pattern and you can see that this involves sine. So what happens to it? It's somehow along the y-axis because sine uh, refers to the, si uh, to the, the y-axis. Uh, same thing happens here. I showed you a different method of approaching that. But really, the bottom line is just pick up a few points, plot points. That's all there is to it. Plot points, everybody. One thing that is important, pay attention to the direction, because in essence, you're dealing with a parametric equation, parametric equations, and you'll see them in calculus too. 
uh, direction is important. Okay, you start with theta equals zero and then you go to pi over two and somewhere in between, you can pick up a couple of points. So from zero to pi over two, what happens? From pi over two and uh, to uh, pi, what happens? And so on and so forth. So take a look at the arrows when you do the graph. Uh, now this one involves cosine and as I mentioned, uh, when it involves cosine, it somehow uh, goes along the x-axis because cosine refers basically to the x-axis. Uh, for this one, notice what happens. The coefficient of cosine is positive two and the constant is number three. Because they are not the same, it won't be a cardioid, okay? So you work it out you end up with this shape. As far as the, the name is concerned, it's called a, a Lemecon without an inner loop. Do you have to memorize it? Not really, just plot the points as far as I'm concerned, that's good enough, okay? And I believe this was the last one we did. I'm gonna look at a couple more examples. There are many, many uh, graphs. As long as you can handle the basics, you're in good shape. So let's um, do this. Let me put this in slide mode. So let me hide this again. So slide mode. So we did that, okay. And what I was referring to, let me just pick up some color here, let's say. And these two numbers I'm referring to. If the absolute value of those two numbers are identical, class, okay? If the absolute values are identical, it becomes a cardioid. If it's not, it, it's not, okay? So that's really the uh, bottom line. And again, just to refresh your memory, okay, we um, graphed this, this wasn't a big deal, okay? and. Uh, for example, if you look at the first one, r comma theta. Okay, was five comma zero. Okay, zero refers to the angle. Okay. As you can see, all of them they give us the r first. See, this is the r. This is the r and so on and so forth, or comma theta. Generally speaking, that's how we write it, okay? And so we did that. Now let's look at this case. Now before we just move on, let, because that you might want to notice this, that if you compare it to this question, again, we have the same situation where the absolute value of the number, the constant, and the coefficient of x are not the same. In this case, the number is larger. I'm talking about the absolute value of that. In this, this case, the coefficient is larger. So what happens as a result, okay? Again, I'm gonna assume everybody can graph this by just plotting pairs. Now, the easy ones, zero, pi over two, pi, okay? 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi, it's not a big deal. You plug in 0 as an example. Everybody can see that. If I plug in 0 here, okay, what happens? Cosine of 0 is 1. 2 plus 3 is 5. Okay. So those are the answers. Okay. Pi over 6. Cosine is the square root of three times two. So that's what it's three times that. You can put it in a parentheses or not. Doesn't matter. By the way, when you want to graph this, you want to approximate that, okay? Pi over four, it's two plus three. This is three class, okay? This is uh, three, you want to Definitely change that accordingly. This is number three, everybody.
Uh, pi over 3, okay, pi over 3 is 1 half. Just so you know, if you put pi over 3, 2 plus 3 cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Okay. And that gives you 2 plus 3 halves, and they add up to 7 halves. I hope you see that. So my point being, coming up with this shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, look at, um, what else do we want to look at? Uh, so if you look at um, pi over 2, okay, it's easy. Pi over 2, cosine is what? Cosine is? zero, cosine of power two is zero. So two plus three times zero. Okay, class? Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Um, uh, three power two is another easy one. Three power two. Cosine of three power two is zero. Three times that is zero plus three is two. Pi is an easy one class. Two plus three cosine pi. Cosine of pi is negative one. Two plus three times negative one is two minus three or negative one. Two pi is an easy one. Two plus three Cosine of 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is the same as cosine of 0, is the same as 5. So it goes back to the same point. You, in fact, you don't have to even put 2 pi because 2 pi takes you to the same location. Understand, class, this should give you the same answer as this. 0 and 2, they should give you the same answer. And so if you write the pairs, this is what you get. Now, if you plot them carefully, and it's really not too bad, okay, um, we can do a couple of them together, and then I'll show you. For example, okay, let's see. Let me use a different color here, so we do a few of them together quickly. Let's say, so the, the first one is five zero. That means theta is zero. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we are here. So you go five tick marks along the x-axis, okay? Or the polar axis, and it's five zero. Let's go with that. Um, let me go with this one also. 2 pi over 2. That means I, uh, okay, let's do this here. This is not going to be to scale. 1, 2, and 3. So let me show you those two points. Okay. Um, so that's... Uh, pi over 2 and 2, okay? And then we have pi negative 1. So let me just also show you this one. Okay. So pi is on this side. It's on the negative side of the x-axis, if you will. But negative one takes it in and believe it or not, gives you this point. And I want to stop for that. Okay, if you look at those points only. Okay. Now, it, you really need a couple of points in between class. Okay. Uh, for example, something here, that means maybe you use this one. Are you with me? Something here. Okay. Uh, you use this one, okay? 2 power 3, where is that? Uh, let me put the asterisk next to it. So you put this one, let me put the asterisk next to it. Okay, so because, you know, just uh, as an example, 2 power 3 and 1 half, 
Okay, so 2 pi over 3. This is 2 pi over 3, and then you do um, 1 half. If you do this very carefully, and this is, you, you need may, maybe even a couple more points, just this portion becomes something like this. And class, now, yeah. if you, let me use a different color. If you do the rest of them, it will look something like this. This is, of course, not to scale or anything. I'll show you a better graph in a moment. But the point being, uh, really, with plotting a few points, you should be able to see that. Okay? So, we can also figure out, it goes through zero, zero, and all you have to do this, by now you have an easy time, you can calculate this by setting it equal to zero. Now, the only reason we didn't get that class, if you look at my pairs, all of them are using what? Common arcs, okay? Common arcs. But if you set this equal to zero, what does it give you? It gives you cosine theta equals negative two-thirds. What does it mean? You need now theta to be equal to cosine inverse of negative two-thirds. That is not a common arc. You can use a calculator and you see that it becomes zero, okay, r becomes zero at some point. And remember what r equals zero represents. If you remember this one class, r equals zero represents the pole, always the pole, okay? R equals zero represents the pole, regardless of what theta is. So even, even if you don't know what that theta is, at some point it has to come back to zero. You follow what I'm saying? I hope it's clear. And so what I want to do, I want to erase this class. Um, I want to uh, erase this and show you a better graph, okay? Let's just do this. So I'm gonna erase this part so you can see. The graph, okay class? Okay, sounds good. Everybody okay with that? Are we ready for the next one? Uh, there yeah. are really, okay, thanks. There are, uh, there are really a, a lot of graphs if you want to think about it. I just don't want to overwhelm you with that. Um, so, from here on, I'm gonna look at one more example and then I have the graphs for you to uh, look at on your own, get uh, comfortable to a certain degree. Also, I'll show you how to graph it with a graphing calculator in a moment. So, do you have to memorize this? No, I just went over that. And the idea is that if you have one plus minus cosine theta. One plus minus cosine theta. Or you have one plus minus sine theta. And you multiply it by any number, some number, k or a. That becomes a cardinal, okay? When these are not the same, then it's not. They give them a name, Lemecons, with an inner loop or without an uh, inner loop. So be it. You have to memorize that No, Just plot the pairs. I think I've shown you there are easy pairs that will give you the answer class, okay? All right. Um, I want to get one more graph with details, and this is, uh, this is called a rose. 
And in general, what happens that if you happen to have um, n theta, r equals uh, cosine n theta r equals cosine. So this is cosine and sine n theta. So if you have n times theta, you just get a shape that it's called a rose, okay? Now, the general idea is that when n is odd, you have petals. The number of petals that you have, the number of leaves, if you will, is just n. But if it's even, it gets multiplied by two. For example, in this case, this is the number that we are interested in, this number sitting in front of theta. If this number is odd, for example, it's five, then you get five petals. If it's two, you get two times two. If it's four, you get four times two. If it's eight, you get eight times two. When it's even, it doubles up. Uh, I highly recommend you use your calculator, and I will show you, to graph a few of them to have an idea, okay? Everybody expects you to understand the basics. Nobody expects you to graph all of these with details, okay? So first, let's look at um, the symmetry and how it works. Uh, basically, you can change the theta to negative theta. And as you can see, nothing changes. Okay. So it is symmetric. Okay. Uh, with <coughs> respect to the first case, which is the uh, polar axis or the x axis. Uh, when we do pi over 2, okay it works out and it's symmetric with respect to the line, the y-axis or theta equals pi over two. And the reason is because class, I want everybody to know why. Remember, for sine and cosine, t was what? Two pi, do you remember that? Okay, that's why. If it's two pi or four pi, if it's any, uh, even multiple of pi, then they are identical, okay? So in other words, in other words, right here, this becomes equals two cosine of negative two theta. And then it becomes this because cosine, as you know, is an even function, okay? Now, um, honestly, you don't have to check the next one because if it is symmetric with both cases, and you can do that, make a note of it. If it's symmetric with both cases, then it's symmetric with respect to the pole, okay? Uh, now I wanna discuss the graph, and when we are done with this, I'll go, I'll go through that. When we are done with this, I'm gonna show you uh, how to use a graphing calculator for that. So let's quickly finish that. Uh, to graph this, why don't we just pick up a few pairs, okay? Zero, zero, just plug in zero. Cosine of zero is one, so you get two, okay? Pi over six, two times pi over six is pi over three. Cosine of that is one half, two times that is one. And you can work on the rest. So I hope you see those pairs, okay? So R theta gives you two zero, okay? One pi over six. Zero pi over four means what? Zero pi over four means the pole, okay? Remember that. Negative one pi over three, negative two pi over two. Now, those are easy pairs to 
graph. I have a feeling nobody has any problem graphing those. Take a look at those. Those are easy uh, to graph. Okay, so we did that. Look at them. Two, zero. One comma pi over six. Zero comma pi over four. That means it's the pole. Negative one pi over three. Remember, pi over three is in the first quadrant. But because r is negative one, you got to extend it into the third quadrant. I hope you remember that. Negative two pi over two. Pi over two is up here. Pi over two is up here, everybody. Pi over two is up here. But we have negative two. It goes in the opposite direction. Now, of course, honestly, if you want to graph this by hand, then you got to go from pi over 2 to pi and see what happens. Then you go from pi to 3 pi over 2, and you go from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, okay? So when you work it out, let me see if I can. It goes something like that. It, it just keeps on going across. I'm trying to show you in what order it works. This is the order that it works, OK? In other words, let me see if I can use a different color. So it goes this way. I hope you are following the arrows. Okay. And of course, this is a better graph. Let me just erase mine so you can see the better graph. I'm going to come back to this. Let me finish that because I want to show you with a um, graphing calculator how it works. Okay, class? So I want to show you with the graphing calculator how it works. Now, the rest of them, I'm not going to spend too much time on them. There are a lot of graphs. I want you to just look at them and have an idea how they are supposed to look like. Okay. And I highly recommend you keep this handy. When you go to Calculus 2 class, you need this. If you keep this handy, when the topic uh, is, is, is discussed in Calculus 2. Spend just, when you go, it's, when you know it's coming up, spend a week before that for a few days and you'll be comfortable to move on. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, the concept of a rose, okay. And the number of pedals, okay. This is the synopsis of the graphs that was discussed and taken care of. Okay, how do we get to a, a vertical line, a horizontal line, a line that goes through the uh, um, origin circles? Okay, um, you name it, cardio, it's lemicons, you know. So these are various types, okay, and then uh, look at the rows that was mentioned, for example, this one, and is they n is odd and this one is even okay so um and you you you'll get used to that in a sense that what we looked at was two cosine two theta and the pedal was uh, uh, laying down along the x axis the polar axis okay uh and so we are going to move on where where it comes to when it comes to sign that won't be the case now, these are some graphs, class. I, I don't want to, you know, again, uh, spend too much time on that. I just want you to uh, remember what we discussed. If you look at the first one, okay, 
the absolute value of a and b are the same it becomes a cardioid okay remember we are looking at a plus b cosine theta a and b are some constants some numbers okay so if absolute value of a and b are identical then it becomes a cardio if uh, absolute value of a is larger okay it becomes a lemicon with an inner loop if it's smaller becomes without an inner loop. Um, we are looking at uh, the rows for part D and E, okay? When we have sine of N theta or cosine of N theta. By the way, just for the sake of argument, cosine starts with the first pedal along the x-axis, okay? But that's not the case for sine. Uh, if r squared is 16 sine 2 theta is a uh, lemniscate, they call it. It's a different graph, but um, this is it, class, okay? This is it. What I want to do, um, I want to graph, I want to show you the graph of what we just did. Uh, on a graphing calculator. So let me stop this one. I'm assuming we are okay with this. All of these graphs are given to you and posted. Okay, let me see. Can you, everybody can see this um, graphing calculator? Yes. Okay, so when we look at okay first thing first you need to do is to click on the mode everybody can see this then you go down normally it's on a function you bring it over to polar and you enter second mode takes you out so you go to y and you put in the equation you want. In this case, we did two cosine two theta. Everybody remembers that, right? Class? Two cosine two theta, you put it in, okay? Two, co you want me to show, everybody knows how to do this, right? Let, let's just, okay, so uh, let's clear it, you put, two cosine two theta and close the parentheses and end. Okay. Uh, if you click on graph, I hope you see the order that it was done. Okay. Let me just, let me just uh, click on the graph again. Okay, now, uh, this is Y, enter, okay, maybe I turn it on and off. I wanted you to see it one more time. Okay, we're gonna go do it again. So let me just do this. Uh, okay, let's clear that. Let's actually do something else. Let's do uh, sine. Uh, it, it, let's do this. Let's let's do this. Let's cosine. Let's do cosine three theta and enter. <clears throat> Okay, so what we have is only uh, three pedals. Let me, because I want to make sure you know yeah, you are comfortable with this. X min is minus three. We are fine. We can, yeah, this is good. So let's go to, let's do one more. Um, let's do, um, let's clear this and let's do sign let's say uh, five data just in case 
and let's craft it. Okay, so uh, you want to make this larger, okay, and you want to see how it uh, runs, and you want to uh, pay attention to uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that it's a parametric equation, and therefore, the order by which each by which it moves. Okay, sounds good. Everybody's okay with that. All right, let's go to section nine point three. Uh, so again, let's just quickly uh, look at the synopsis of what we just covered and go to the new section. In this section, we deal with the complex plane and the Moore's theorem. Okay. So uh, we are going to plot points in complex plane. We're going to convert it from, again, a complex now everybody remembers a plus b i class that's a complex okay uh, between the rectangular form and polar form okay we're going to look at the product the quotient of complex numbers and use the Moore's theorem to raise them to a power and find complex roots so that's what we are going to do uh, so we have covered some stuff as far as trigonometry and polar coordinates are concerned. Okay. And so now we are going to go to the new section. Let me put this in slide mode. Uh, here's the synopsis of the section class. Um, let me just quickly go over that. Um, Everybody remembers A plus B I, right? Now, whether we say A plus B I or we say X plus Y I, it means the same thing. It depends on the text. And by the way, we call this Z. Z represents a complex number. Where A and B or X and Y are both, you know, uh, real numbers okay we are this is the synopsis of the section we will look at more detail so when you look at a rectangular coordinate system now the x-axis will be your real axis but the y-axis will be your imaginary axis okay and as you remember i by definition was square root of negative one okay now when we want to find the magnitude of this complex number, also known as the modulus, the way we write it is, it looks like an absolute value of Z, but it's called the modulus, okay? So the absolute value of Z, or the square root of X squared plus Y squared, which is equal to that R, the good old R that we know it's the it's using the Pythagorean theorem, okay? Uh, relationship, X is R cosine theta, Y is R sine theta, nothing, you know, uh, brand new, you've seen it, okay? And uh, normally we like to use R which is positive and theta is between zero and two pi, as far as complex numbers are concerned. And in polar form, therefore, Z, which is X plus Y, I becomes R cosine theta plus I, R sine theta. Now here's a shorthand notation. So I hope you appreciate the shorthand notation. R cis theta, R cis theta. That means R cosine theta plus I sine theta. This is a shorthand notation. Instead of writing the whole thing, you can write R cis theta, and it means the same thing. Again, this is being repeated just as polar, okay? Now, what is new would be this stuff. If you want to multiply, everybody remembers how we did the multiplication of complex numbers. I hope everybody remembers that. We, we just do the foiling, and then I squared is negative one. Do you remember that? Uh, how about the division? We had to multiply by the complex conjugate, if you recall. 
Okay, let me just write one example so you see. If we had, let's say five minus, okay. If we had five minus two i over three plus i, I hope you remember how we did this and I'm not gonna go through that, I'm just gonna remind you the process was to multiply by what? The complex conjugate of the denominator and going through that, you know that. Now we have actually an easier method, okay? If you wanted to make a power out of it, for example, how about, let's say five minus two i to the power of 10. That would be very difficult. But if you put it in this format using polar, it's really simple. The same thing with the root. So this is the synopsis of the section. Let's make some sense out of it by looking at a few simple examples class. Okay, uh, that's the same thing that we had over there. So uh, let's start with this very simple example. All right, let's see what we need to do. The question is, given z equals square root of three minus i, we wanna put, put this in polar form, okay? So basically what it says, we wanna put it in this form, everybody. R cis theta. And you can even write it like that, R cis theta. Uh, whatever R is, you replace it. Whatever theta is, you replace it. That's fine. But what is R? Well, R squared is X squared plus Y squared. So everybody can find R easily. Okay. Uh, before we do that, let's just plot the pair. Okay. Plot the point, not the pair, the point. Meaning uh, Z equals square root of three minus I. Okay. We go square root of three, which is almost... Uh, 1.71 to the right along the real axis. And then minus i, one unit down along the y axis, which we call it now imaginary axis, not the y axis, okay, class? So we go down and that gives us this location. All right. Now what is r? r is x squared plus y squared, take a root. Okay, and what is x square root of three? What is y negative one? So you can come up with number two. So this is an easy uh, uh, math, okay, class? Now the next one, we need to find theta, okay? When we calculate tan theta, and we're gonna do it in a moment, it's important to know which quadrant. We already know it's in the third quadrant, so we have an idea how it should look like. That's extremely important. So tan theta is y over x, which is negative one over square root of three or negative square root of three over three. Okay. First and foremost, This is the angle, which is the positive angle we're gonna use. Now, before we get to the angle, okay, let, let me just remind you, if tan theta was square root of three over three, theta was pi over six, everybody knows that, right? What does it mean? Pi over six is the reference arc. Reference arc. Okay, so what is the angle that we want? In the fourth quadrant is two pi minus pi over six. Two pi minus pi over six, okay, class? So Z is R cis theta. You can write it like this, or you can write it, uh, write it like this, two cis, 11 pi over six. 
I hope everybody is following what happened here. So one more time, let's quickly recap. Plot and write the complex number in polar form. Z equals square root of three minus I. We go square root of three units along the X axis. Now we call it the real axis. We go one unit down because the coefficient of I is negative one. So we go one unit down along the Y axis. Now we call it imaginary axis. So that's the point. So it's in the fourth quadrant. We calculate the R, we calculate the theta, it was explained and you're done. It's that simple. All right. Sorry, could you go back one second? I didn't copy the last. Sure, 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 sure. Thank you. My pleasure. So again, uh, either way is fine, okay? You can write it as R C theta or just write the uh, long version. When we wanna evaluate it, class, when we wanna evaluate and take this, if we wanna take this to rectangular format, we better write it as such, okay? Because we have to write cosine, evaluated, multiplied by two, we have to write the sign, evaluated, multiplied by two, and so forth. Here's an example. We want to, uh, remember we are converting. Z is two cosine 30 degrees, plus I sine 30 degrees. So the point is, okay, let's go to what? To rectangular format. How do you go to rectangular format? Replace the cosine 30 degrees, it happened to be a common arc. What is cosine 30 degrees? 30 degrees, what is sine 30 degrees? Cosine of 30 is square root of three over two and sine is one half, okay? So when you do the math, you get square root of three plus i, you can plot it uh, either way is fine, okay? Now, let me explain about plotting this. There are really two ways to do that. You can plot that right in the beginning by doing the following. Make up the angle of 30 degrees and then two tick marks, okay? That would be the point. Or come up with the rectangular form and figure it out. Square root of three plus i, that means square root of three along the x-axis. Remember, it's the real axis, not the x-axis. Positive one along the y-axis. Remember, it's imaginary axis, okay? So that's very straightforward. How about this one? I guess everybody can figure it out. That shouldn't be a problem. So all you have to do, figure out cosine of three pi over two. What is cosine of three pi over two, everybody? Cosine of three pi over two, nobody knows? Wow, zero. What is sine of three pi over two? Negative, Negative one. one, very good. So in this case, in this case, R is given as three, theta is given as three pi over two. And if you do the math, you end up with negative three I. And what you can see, we get negative three I, right class? Okay. Uh, what I want to do, I want to quickly look at one more example and then we take a few minutes of break. Before we do so, I hope you see it's a very straightforward process. Using the complex plane, the x-axis is called the real axis, the y-axis is called the imaginary axis. It's that simple, okay? 
And the relationship is what we have seen before. R squared is X squared plus Y squared. And we can find the angle as well. So let's look at uh, the following. This was on the first page that we discussed. So let's quickly recap. If we have Z sub one and Z sub two as two different complex numbers, their product Z sub one times Z sub two equals R one, R two, and then cosine of the sum plus I sine of the sum. For Z1 over Z2, we divide R1 over R2 and then cosine of the difference plus I sine of the difference. And I'm repeating that at the bottom, okay? All right, so here's an example. We are given a Z and W or Z sub one and Z sub two. The first one is three cis 20 degrees. That means R sub one is three and theta is 20 degrees. W is five cis 100 degrees. That means R sub two is five and theta is 100 degrees. Okay. So we want to find their product and their quotient. So Z times W uses the first formula. Okay. It uses the first formula, everybody. R sub one times R sub two, cis theta one plus theta two. So what is R sub one? Number three. What is R sub two? Number five. So this is R sub one class, and this is R sub two. So three times five. And cis add up the 20 degrees to 100 degrees. That's what this formula says. I hope you see how easy this thing is, okay? So it's 15 cis 120 degrees, and believe it or not, you're done. If you want to change this to a rectangular form, we can do that, but that's not the question. Now, what about Z over W? We are going to use this equation, as you can see, Z sub one over Z sub two, everybody. Z sub one over Z sub two, which is R sub one over R sub two, which means three over five, cis theta one, which is 20 degrees, minus theta two, which is 100 degrees. And you're done. All you have to do, change this to what? 20 minus 100 or negative 80 degrees. Now, remember what we said, we like to have a positive R. Okay, class. We like to have a positive R and we like to have a theta between zero and two pi between zero and two pi. So all you have to do, this is negative, add two pi, meaning what? Add 360 degrees, okay class? Add 360 degrees and you get 280 degrees. And this is it for now. I'm gonna pause the recording. All right, so we're going to look at um, more examples, and we mentioned this theorem known as the Moore's theorem. Look at what happens when you want to raise 
a complex number to a power when it's given in this format. Okay. So uh, basically, you multiply the theta by n. Okay. Complex number in polar form. You multiply it by n. If you happen to have an R in front, then you have to raise that to the power of it. Uh, I've shown you the proof at the end. Uh, you can, there are a lot more pages than what we are going to cover. I highly recommend you look at them in case. Uh, so here's a very simple example. So again, Look at the bottom is, is the information we just covered in this section. First, the, on the right side, it gives you the format that was discussed, Z equals R C theta, the uh, polar format, and the relationship between R and X and Y, if you will, okay. Um, tan theta and so forth. And the Demoir's the theorem on the right side, uh, so we want to raise this to the power of four. According to the Moore's theorem, okay, if we want to raise this to the power of four, we have to raise two to the power of four. And then we need to multiply the argument, if you will, of uh, cosine and sine, that means 15 degrees by four. So this is what happens according to the Moore's theorem. Now, uh, two to the power of four is 16, four times 15 degrees is 60 degrees. Now, what is cosine of 60 degrees? One half. What is sine of 60 degrees, square root of three over two. And this is the answer. Now imagine if the number wasn't in polar format, but rather in a rectangular format, and you wanted to raise it to the power of four, it would take a long time, okay? So if they give us a complex number, they expect us to raise it to a power. One easy way, if it's in polar format, so be it. If not, change it to polar format and then move on. Okay, class? I hope everybody's comfortable with that. Here's the next one. Z is equal to one minus I, we want to find Z to the power of 10. The way it's given, it's very difficult. One minus I to the power of 10, we have to use the binomial theorem and do the math and it takes forever. Instead, we are going to rewrite this first and foremost in the form of Z equals R cis theta, meaning putting it in polar form. To do that, we need to find the value of R or the absolute value of Z or the modulus, whatever you want to call that. And as you can see, the coefficient, uh, the uh, constant is one and the coefficient of I is negative one. So that's an easy calculation, right? And I want to make sure everybody is uh, following that. So it's square root of one squared plus negative one quantity squared. That gives us the, uh, um, if you will, R or Z absolute value for the modulus. And what is theta? Okay, theta we should easily figure out one minus I, okay. So you can go with, uh, if you graph one minus I, one to the right and one down, it gives you in the fourth quadrant and they are identical. 
So pi over four is your uh, reference arc and it ends up being a negative pi over four. Now, for the sake of this calculation class, if you do not change negative pi over four to something positive, which is what? By the way, if you want to change it, you add two pi, you know that, right? Okay, and it gives you seven pi over four. If you don't do that for this calculation, then it makes no difference. When you want to represent it, normally we like to represent it with a positive one, but remember what we are doing, we are raising z to the power of two. All right, so uh, with that being the case, and remember, we have to put it back in the format that we got. So according to the Moore's theorem, okay, R, okay, and, and by the way, cosine of negative pi over four, R sine of negative pi over four, you can keep it at, as negative pi over four, or in the case of cosine, it will change but we're gonna stick with the same thing. So again, negative pi over four or seven pi over four. All right, so we have to use square root of two as r and raise it to the power of 10. And then we multiply the argument of cosine and sine, which is negative pi over four by uh, 10. So everybody is following that. We are using obviously the Morse theorem. Okay, so with that being the case, what is the square root of two to the power of 10? That's the same as two to the power of five or 32, okay? Now we're gonna multiply the 10. We get <clears throat> negative 10 pi over four or negative five pi over two. So negative 10 pi over four, or negative five pi over two. All right, so it's a simple case. Uh, negative five pi over two, remember it has gone one complete revolution in a negative direction. So you can uh, add two pi if you will, so you have an idea of what you're dealing with. If you add a two pi, you get just minus pi over two. Now, cosine of minus pi over two is the same as cosine of three pi over two, or it's the same as uh, cosine of pi over two, which is zero. Because remember, cosine is actually an even function. Now this one, this negative actually comes out, becomes minus i sine of power two, or you can replace the negative power two, sine of negative power two with negative one. Sine of power two is positive one with the negative makes a negative times 32, negative 32 i. It's a very simple calculation using the Moore's theorem, okay? negative 32i. Sounds good, everybody? All right, uh, let's go to the next example. So in short, one minus i to the power of 10 is negative 32i. And I really, I hope you appreciate this process because remember, uh, if we were going to do it before this, we have to raise one minus i to the power of 10. So that is really not an easy task. It takes a very long time to do that, okay? So the Moore's theorem makes life easy. So with that being the case, let's look at this example. So what I want to do, I want to pause the recording, give everybody a moment, see if you can figure this out without paying at any attention to, uh, of course, the uh, solution. All right, it, it's a very simple case following the, uh, the Moore's theorem. 
basically what we do, we are going to raise this to the power of six. That means square root of three to the power of six and then 10 degrees times six. Okay. Now, square root of three to the power of six means three cubed. I hope you know that. And that is 27. So cosine of 60 degrees plus I sine of 60 degrees. Now, what is cosine of 60 degrees? One half. What is sine of 60 degrees? Square root of three over two. So you multiply it by 27 and you're done. So the answer is 27 halves plus 27 square root of three over two i. This would be your final answer. Okay, class? This would be your final answer. All right, uh, I'm gonna look at one more topic and example. And if you want, you can look at a few more examples on your own at the end and also the proof of uh, the Moore's theorem that I have for you, okay? I highly recommend that you spend some time finishing off this PowerPoint on your own. But let's look at the last page. So the Moore's theorem is very simple, class. Now the next thing we have is finding roots. How do we find roots? Finding roots is really the reverse process. So if you want to find the nth root of a number in complex form in a polar format or cosine or cis theta or theta sub zero. But the reason we are using theta sub zero, it's a specific number, okay? Um, so an n is larger than or equal to uh, two because we are taking a root. Remember that when n is one is just the answer is itself, okay? So we are taking a root. So if we are taking the nth root, well, we have to take the nth root of r. So that's obvious. But what happens to uh, the argument of uh, cosine and sine? The methodology is that you divide by n. Remember, if you want to raise it to a power, you multiply, right? Now you divide. But to get to all of them, you have to add a 2k pi divided by n. That is the process, everybody. OK? And k can be any number all the way uh, starting from zero to n minus one. Because if you go all the way to n, it repeats itself, okay? That's the reason. So let's look at a very simple example to see how this thing works. We wanna find complex cube roots of negative four. Let me make sure everybody understands what we are looking at. When we say complex cube roots of minus four, it really means the following. I wanna make sure algebraically everybody understands what this means. This means x cubed is minus four. So you wanna find the x, okay class? That's the idea behind that. Now, if you look at this one, that's the meaning of it. If you look at this one, it means x cubed plus four equal to zero. It means there must be three roots because the exponent is three. There are three complex roots and that's important to understand, okay? There are three complex roots, okay? Now, one of them is easy to find if you use a calculator, uh, the cube root of negative four, it gives you a number. But there are two more because according to the uh, algebraic uh, theorem regarding polynomials, 
of x cubed plus four, it's a polynomial equation and it has three roots. So how do we find it? We use this method. Before we start, we have to change the negative four to its format in polar format. And that's an easy one. Remember where negative four is, is along the x-axis on the negative side. So I hope you see, you really don't have to work this out. Negative four, so the absolute value of that is R and uh, the angle is pi. Just to give you an idea quickly, This is negative four, four tick marks to the left, right? And so uh, the R is four and the angle is pi or 180 degrees, okay? Now we can either use pi or, uh, um, we, we, we either can use the radians or degrees makes no difference. Most of the time it's a tad easier to work with degrees and that's what we are going to do. So let's look at the formula. So if we want the uh, nth root, okay, uh, we are going to take the root, which one? The cube root. Okay, so we're gonna use this cube root of r. That means cube root of four. And then we are going to use theta zero, which we found it to be 180. We're gonna divide it by three because we want what? Three roots, remember that, cube roots. And then we add two k pi, two k times pi, that means 360 degrees times k is the same thing, divided by three. So you have a choice. You use two k pi divided by n or 360 degrees times k divided by n, okay? Two k pi divided by n is the same as 360k divided by n. That's the same thing, okay, class. Now, what do we put in? We replace k with zero, one, two, and if we use three, we get to the same answer. It just goes a complete revolution beyond that, okay? So you are repeating the answer. So let's see what we get. Uh, first, if you replace the k with zero, you get cube root of four cosine of 60 degrees, okay? Cis 60 degrees, the same thing, i sine of 60 degrees. Now, if you replace the k with one, you have to add 120 degrees, okay, class? And 120 degrees, when you add it to 60, gives you 180, okay? And you can do, uh, you can replace the K with two, okay? And you have to add 240 degrees to 60 degrees, that gives you 300 degrees. So let's do this, okay? So remember what we have, we have to use k equals zero, one, two. We have divided everything by three, okay? So when we do that, let's see what happens. If you plug in zero, plus if you plug in zero, you just get cosine of 60 plus i sine of 60. This is not going to go away, it's gonna repeat itself. If you replace it with one, Okay, so again, cube root of four, cis 180 degrees. If you replace it with two, cube root of four, cis 60 plus 120 times two, which is 300 degrees. Okay. Everybody can see all those three and how we arrived at it, class. Okay, so this is how you get the complex roots. Uh, 
Um, Professor, I had a question on how you got negative four equals four cis pi equals four cis 180. Yes, of course. Okay, take a look at this top graph. Let's locate negative four, okay? Number negative four, okay, it's a complex number. Remember what the number is. The number is a plus bi or x plus yi, so it's negative four plus zero i. Do you follow what I'm saying? So that means four units to the left, and that's it. It's really on the negative side of the x-axis, or the, or better yet, the real axis. If you're, in other words, this is purely a real number. Okay, thank you. Sure. So this this angle is pi, or 180 degrees. Okay, pi or one. In other words, class, if you happen to have a purely real number where a coefficient of i is zero. It's on the x-axis, which we call it the real axis now. Okay, class? So for example, if it's a number which is positive on the right side, let's say number five. Number five is here, right? Class, five is here. So we should recognize five is five cis what? Zero degrees. It's in the positive direction. In the negative direction, it's always the number without the negative, that's R, okay? Cis pi. So a number on the positive side of the real axis uh, has the number and cis zero on the negative side has the number and cis pi. I hope that answers the question. That works out, everybody? Now, let's uh, discuss this a little bit further, and that's the following, okay? What I want you to notice is this, and this is going to help uh, coming up with um, an answer. If you're interested in finding roots, uh, complex roots of a number, any number, okay? you have to take the root of its modulus, okay, uh, r or absolute value of z. In this case, r happened to be uh, four class, but whatever the r is that you have to calculate. And then you come up with a circle centered at zero, zero with such a radius, okay? And then if you want um, the cube root, you cut that circle into three equal pieces. Remember, it's 360 degrees. If you want five roots, let's say you wanted the fifth root of this number, okay? Now, obviously, the magnitude would be the fifth root of four. Then you would cut 360 degrees into how, what? five equal pieces, okay? So they are equally spaced on a circle, and all you have to do come up with the first one. If you look at the very first one, it says cosine of uh, cube root of four, cis 60 degrees, so 60 degrees. So I want you to pay attention to this. This is 60 degrees, everybody. This is the first one. This one is the location of the first one. And then you add 120 degrees. So this adds 120 degrees. 120 degrees with 60, they add up to 180 degrees. Okay, 180 degrees. And then you add, let me use a different color here. Now you add hundred twenty degrees again, and that gives you three hundred degrees. 
that's how you arrive at those answers. I hope everybody is okay with that class. Okay. Now, here's another thing that hopefully it will help you with the concept here. What if we were asked to come up with the roots for a very simple number, number one. So I'm gonna erase this, so I give it, I'm gonna erase this class. Okay, I'm gonna erase that. Take a look at this one. Complex cube roots of one. First of all, one is a positive number. So it's one, six, zero degrees. One, six, zero degrees. Because you want the cube root, that means you're, you have the following, let me just make sure. This really means you wanna solve the following class, x cubed equals one. And there are three roots. In fact, you can find the three roots by writing x cubed minus one equal to zero, factor it. I hope you remember factoring of a cubed minus b cubed. And one of them becomes one, which is actually this point. And the other two are complex. In fact, I highly recommend you do this on your own using algebra. It can be done using, using algebra and uh, the quadratic formula. Okay. Now, so 360 degrees divided by three gives you 120 degrees. So this goes 120 degrees. And this goes another 120 degrees, which is 240 degrees. And they are all on the circle with R being equal to one, which happened to be a unit circle. Okay. Now think about, okay, as an example, think about the fifth root of one. See if you can come up with that on your own, which means the following. Okay, with the same concept that I just mentioned. Okay, so one is, remember what's one. One is one, six, zero, and you guys take it from there. I'm assuming uh, everybody's following this. It's really very straightforward class. There is not much to it, okay? All right. I'm gonna go to the next section. Is there any questions? Is everybody okay with this? We have covered a lot, but what we have covered, none of them is really that, is that bad, is that difficult, okay? It's really pretty straightforward, okay? All right, um, I'm assuming we're done here and we are ready for the next section, okay, everybody? All right, we want to cover section 9.4, vectors. So in this section, we are going to look at the concept of vectors, uh, position vector, uh, add and subtract vectors algebraically, find scalar multiples of those, find a unit vector, let's get rid of this. Um, find a vector from its direction and magnitude and look at uh, some applications 
involving that. Okay, class. All right. So again, we covered some trigonometric identities, polar coordinates, how we go from one format to the next. We looked at polar graphs also. There are many, many different graphs involving polars. Okay. And we covered um, complex plane. This is the synopsis of that. Uh, the x-axis, now we call it the real axis. The y-axis, we call it the imaginary axis class. Okay, that's why. If a number is purely real, it's on the real axis. If it's positive on the right side, if it's negative on the left side, if it's positive, becomes R cis zero. So any number on the right side. Any number on the left side becomes R cis pi or 180 degrees, okay? So when we covered that, we looked at uh, the relationship between the two, okay, the polar and rectangular format, okay. Uh, we also uh, looked at uh, the product, okay, the quotient uh, of uh, complex numbers, and we finished it with the De Moore's theorem and complex roots. Uh, the thing I wanted to mention, I think I mentioned that, I'm not too sure. Um, Z Class Z is X plus Y I. Okay, let me put this in slide mode. Okay, and let me see what color. Yeah. So this is Z. Now Z bar is the complex conjugate class by definition. Z bar is the complex conjugate. Okay. For example. If Z is two minus I, Z bar is two plus I, okay? So, and the square root of Z, Z bar becomes the same as R. Okay. Uh, so, this is already given, okay? So, the Moore's theorem, you really don't need to worry about that. It's already here, okay? So you have that taken care of. Okay, that's uh, right here. Okay. Okay, class. Uh, let's start with vectors. I, I think we sort of discussed that uh, vectors are uh, quantities that have magnitude and direction. Uh, we have a lot of examples in, in uh, you know, physics, for example, uh, uh, weight ver versus mass or velocity versus speed, okay? Uh, so that's important to uh, understand. Weight is a vector, okay? It's a, it's a force and force has uh, not only magnitude, or, or also direction. So it's important. So if it's in the opposite direction, then it becomes a negative of that. I want you to know that. So with that being the case, uh, let's look at a couple of uh, pictures here and uh, compare and contrast some of the stuff that uh, are interesting in uh, relation to a vector. First, we are looking at a line. Uh, this line contains uh, two points, P and Q, okay? Now this one is a line segment because we end at P and we end at Q. So first we have a line, then we have a line segment. However, and remember, line continues indefinitely on both sides. However, if we happen to have the following situation, okay? where we have an initial point and a terminal point. Terminal point is shown by an arrow. It's a 
directed line segment PQ. In other words, it's a vector PQ. Okay, class? It is a vector. So this is called a vector. It has a magnitude, which is a distance from P to Q. And it's a direction, it has a direction which is from P to Q. Okay. Now, when it comes to vectors, vectors are considered identical if they have the same magnitude and direction. So two vectors are equal if they have the same magnitude and direction. It doesn't matter where you put them in the space. As long as they're, so for example, you can see the magnitude is the same. How about direction? They are parallel, everybody. All three vectors are parallel. That means same direction. So one more time. They are all parallel, they all have the same magnitude, and they all point the same way, okay? That's how you know they are equal. So the equality of the vector, it doesn't matter where it belongs, but rather what is its magnitude and what is its direction. Now, if this is the case, then there are some properties involved when it comes to addition and so forth. So that's what we want to discuss. So first thing first, what is a vector, definition of a vector, and what makes vectors to be equal. The next thing we want to look at, what about addition? Everybody remembers uh, some properties for the operation of addition. Uh, for example, um, addition is commutative, addition is associative, okay? Uh, and it's exactly the same thing when it comes to uh, vectors, okay? We can add them in any order we want. It makes no difference. Uh, also, everybody remembers the uh, idea behind adding to a zero, okay? Um, when you add any number to zero, you get the same number back, okay? Uh, if you add a number to its opposite, you get the zero back. Now, of course, in this case, sometimes we use this one. Instead of writing it like this, they write it like this to represent a zero vector rather than just a zero number, okay? So, if you recall, zero was considered the identity element. That was the terminology we used in, um, I don't know, elementary algebra. Zero is the identity element for addition, okay? And then we have negative of that, the opposite, if you will. Okay, the negative or the opposite, okay? So they are very uh, straightforward. Now we are assuming alpha and beta are scalars, meaning they are just numbers, they are constants. When we say scalars, we really mean just the basic numbers that we know, basic coefficients that we have been dealing with constants. So here's the definition of a subtraction, again, some of you may remember this from elementary algebra, when we define subtraction in the beginning, we said um, A minus B, that means A plus negative B. So subtracting B from A meant adding the opposite of that. So subtracting the W vector from the V vector means adding the negative of that, okay? So, uh, these are properties of scalar products. When you multiply uh, anything by zero, you remember you get zero. The same thing works out here. 
and you multiply anything by one, you get the, every, anything by zero gives you zero, anything by one gives you the same thing back. If you multiply it by negative one, it will reverse the order and it will give you the opposite of that, if you will. Uh, alpha and beta, remember, they are uh, just scalars. Now, the reason we have it in this format, because alpha and beta may not be type of numbers, we can add them up. If we can add them up, of course we add it. If one of them is two, one of them is five, we add them up to seven. And then we multiply by V, okay? If we multiply uh, alpha by V plus W, this is distributive property, distributive property, okay? Uh, and the last one is the associative property of multiplication, okay? So these are the same properties that we have dealt with when we dealt with numbers class, operation on numbers. So in short, operations on vectors are very similar to operations on numbers. So, so far, Every property that we have seen dealing with numbers works out here. And so here's another thing that is important. If you look at this simple, you know, uh, uh, diagram that you see that the V versus negative V, same magnitude, opposite direction, okay? or what about two V, same direction, that, but the magnitude is two times, okay? So the magnitude is two times. All right. So I hope this stuff is, is very straightforward so far. We are looking at operations of vectors, very similar to operations of numbers. All right, we are ready to move on. So when we want to add vectors, we add them geometrically as follows, okay? We put the initial point of one to the terminal point of the other, okay, if you will. So, this is the terminal point for V. This is the initial point for W. And if we are adding the two, we start with the initial point of one and the terminal point of the other. Okay. You can use a triangular method or you can use parallelogram method. The second one is a parallelogram. Please check this out class. This is a triangle. In this case, here's the V and look at the W. You put it like that. So how do you put them together? You put their initial together. See, both of them, this is the initial everybody. And then you draw the diagonal of this parallelogram as the answer. I hope you see the methodology. It is absolutely up to you, but both of them work. <clears throat> so you can put the initials next to each other. In this case, you have to use a parallelogram or you can put the initial of one and the terminal of the other one together and the initial to the terminal gives you the final answer. Now, 
Um, opposite vectors was discussed. V plus zero is zero plus V is V. V plus minus V is zero. The difference was discussed. Uh, commutative property was discussed. We are, you know, sort of going over the same concept by looking at a couple of graphs. Commutative. Uh, if I said V plus W or W plus V makes no difference, okay, class? In any order. Now, let's take a look at this one and see how this thing is going to uh, work, okay? U and V can be added. And then we add it to W. This is called associative property. And you have different ways of adding them up uh, in any format that you want to do it, that would be fine. Again, <clears throat> just, just one example would be, okay, uh, everybody, this is U, this is V, this is W. This is one of them as an example. Okay. <clears throat> the point being, in what order do you add them up? Uh, it has no bearing. Now, take a look at uh, the opposite. Okay, class. So take a look at the opposite. And take a look at the difference, everybody. Take a look at the difference. The way it's done. So instead of saying V plus W, uh, V, I'm sorry, V minus W, we say V plus the opposite. So V plus negative W. In essence, okay, it may be easier to do this. Take a look at this one class. I don't want to, you know, this is minus W, and then you connect this point to this point. Okay, this is one way to do that. <clears throat> so V minus W. You come up with negative W, and then you move the negative W down to make life easier. So take a look at this very last picture and compare the V plus W to V minus W. All right, let's look at um, a, let's look at an example. Okay, uh, involving vectors. Vector addition, if you will. Let's look at this simple example. V minus W, 2V plus 3W, and 2V minus W plus U. Uh, I want to pause the recording, give everybody a minute. Remember, uh, the first one, you first come up with negative W, then you put them together. The other one, 2V just extended. 3W just extend, extended by three times. See if you can figure this out. Let's give everybody a minute by pausing the recording. Uh, 
and basically uh, remember what's W. So this is minus that. Do you follow what I'm saying? And uh, so all you have to do, you can uh, move it accordingly. Okay. If I move it here, just for the sake of argument, Boy, I didn't do a good job. So something like this. Then this is the answer. Okay. So um, okay, v minus w. So just move the w, reverse it, and then add them up. Okay. Now, multiply the V by two, W by three, and put them together. See, two V, three W, that's very straightforward, I hope. Right, class? Just make the V double in size, W three times in size, that's all, Not, nothing else. Now, two V, okay, it's the same thing again. We're gonna use the same thing, two V. Uh, minus W, we're going to use this one. And then we use the U. So take a look. This is 2V. This is minus W. And this is U. And from the initial to the last one. I hope it's straightforward. It's really not that big of a deal. Okay, class? Sounds good. We are ready to go to the next page. Okay. Magnitude of the vector. Okay, or the norm. The notation is that you use two lines. It looks like two absolute value. This is the notation. This notation refers to the magnitude of the vector. So to do that, we need to have some sort of an algebraic way of representing a vector. So a vector If you represent the vector with a comma b, and the notation is not a, is a, as you see, it uses like the less than and greater than sign. Okay. If a p has coordinates a comma b, then the vector a comma b is an algebraic vector when the initial point is at the origin, and we call it a position vector. So what is a position vector? The initial point is the origin. That's all there is to it. Okay. The terminal point, wherever it is. The initial point is the origin. That's the definition of a position vector. What is a position vector? Is a vector whose initial is the origin. Now, algebraically, we represent it in this format, ai plus bj, or a comma b, and ai, I means in the x direction, j in the y direction. 
We also have K in the Z direction. I want you to know that this one, I and J are not, and it, it's got nothing to do with the complex numbers, okay? So A, I, okay. I is the unit vector, if, if this is one class, along the x-axis. This is the I vector. And this, let me use a different color. And this one, is the J vector along the Y axis, okay? So for example, five I, that means come five to the right, uh, plus seven J, that means go up by seven, okay? So it's just like uh, a point and how we represent it in a rectangular coordinate system, okay? So the components are A and B. Uh, Sometimes they use xi plus yj, depending on the text class. It means the same thing. So x times i plus y times j. Having said that, any uh, vector that has a magnitude, we can clearly see the magnitude is just the square root of a squared plus b squared, okay? So this magnitude can be easily calculated using Pythagorean theorem. Okay. So the magnitude is always greater than or equal to zero. So these are some properties that I think are very straightforward. So let's go over the properties. The magnitude of a vector is always zero or larger. The magnitude of a ve vector, part B, part B. If it's zero, then the vector must be zero. It must be a zero vector. Two vectors that are opposite of each other, they have the same magnitude. The difference is their direction, okay? The difference is their direction. And if you multiply it by any number, any number, A or alpha, is just a number, a scalar, you can take it out as an absolute value, okay? Now, what is a unit vector? I just mentioned that. Along the x-axis and along the y-axis, we have i and j, but in general, a unit vector is any vector, as long as its magnitude is equal to one. All right, we have a lot of definitions here. I'll go over it, and then I will go over the definitions again as we come across examples. So I'm covering a lot of uh, definitions. Now, a vector with initial and terminal points as given is equal to the following position vector. Okay. X sub two minus X sub one comma Y sub two minus Y sub one. Two vectors are identical if their components are identical. That's the meaning of this last uh, statement class. This is the meaning of a last statement. Uh, let me take a couple more minutes uh, going over the next page. So when we come back, we are ready to look at more examples. So I hope they are straightforward. And the next page, repeats some of the stuff we have seen. Here's the properties again. The addition, okay, properties of addition was discussed. Now we are showing the same properties using components class. I hope you see that we are not really changing anything. We are not really adding anything. We are just using the components to show how the addition works. You add up the components or you subtract them, okay?
if V is uh, defined as A1I plus B1J, and W is defined as A2I and B2J, when we want to add them up, we add up their components. When we want to subtract them, we subtract the components. When we want to multiply by any number, we just multiply the components by those numbers. Okay. The magnitude was discussed. Okay. The magnitude of any vector is found this way. And this is one interesting property. What this one says, a vector is equal to its magnitude times the unit vector in the same direction. So there is a way to find the unit vector for a specific vector. We discuss that later on. Okay. But this is by definition. And what is a unit vector? A unit vector is defined as the vector divided by its magnitude. A unit vector is, de is defined as the vector divided by its magnitude. Finally, for this page, the last definition I want to give you. How do you find a vector? If the direction and magnitude is given, you're going to multiply the, the magnitude by cosine alpha i plus sine alpha j. And please understand, cosine goes with x. Coordinate, if you will, sine goes with the y coordinate. Uh, this is it for tonight. I'd like you to study this so when we come back on Thursday, it becomes nice and easy to move on. I'm going to pause the recording.